much. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, quick overview of what we've done so far. We've just started uh, going down the list of items and making sure whatever is marked for octopus still makes sense or not. And then we can figure out what else we can mark for octopus and also define the amount of effort required for each of those items. Uh, so far, uh, we've, we've, we are all in agreement that uh, EC recovery below min size will make it to Octopus and it's almost ready to go. Uh, the second item stage was uh, warn of insufficient capacity to tolerate failure at crash level X. And I think we wanted to do it for Octopus the last time we discussed this item. Yep. Good. Okay. The next one on the list is adaptive recovery settings. And we had some discussion around this at the Rados meeting at Cephalicon. And I think we still want to do it. Uh, we might want to have a more detailed discussion about it at a CDM or something. Uh, but that's definitely on the list of things we want to do for Octopus. Anybody yeah. have any opinion? Yeah. I'm kind of reconsidering whether we want to do this for octopus or not. Um, I guess it's mostly about increasing the efficiency of uh, recovery and backfill. But it seems like mm -hmm. uh, there are kind of more things that we could do to highlight kind of wh where things are stuck and, and provide more controls around that. And then focus more on the longer term QoS work. Hmm. Okay. So um, maybe if that's the case, then we might want to prioritize the other stuff that could highlight where things are stuck and like things like that and prioritize those over this and make sure we have Trello boards for those as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think okay. we have a few of those in here already um, leading to us like at the bottom, there's the OST report, what still apps are blocked by and mm -hmm. I think there's one somewhere, uh, yeah, OSD collect ping reply times. Right. So I'll move those up. Got the first thing. And then there's probably more that we can think of uh, to do there as well, in terms of figuring out how to expose uh, what potential problems the cluster is running into or where performance problems are, are arising. Yeah, I thought that was more about like if there's no, let's just say all client activity stops, then you would just allow recovery to go full, full speed. It's yeah, that's the, really that's a quality the, uh, of service. That's, and, uh, yeah, I think Josh, we can use some more discussion there. I mean, the way you are looking at it is that you think it's not as much as a problem uh, uh, to not have those adaptive and still be able to make use of those to achieve some level of quality of service? Yeah, I guess I, my thinking is more that um, the adaptive recovery is about increasing the efficiency of and speed of recovery and backfill at times of right. low plant load. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like we have a lot of cases today where uh, it's kind of hard to determine when things are going slowly what the cause is, and it'd be better maybe to focus on those cases rather than increasing the speed of backfill and recovery. When what things are going slowly? Client recovery or both? Client IO. Client IO. Okay. Slowly because there isn't very much of it, or going slowly because it's being blocked? Um, the, the, the latter. Sorry? The latter. So it's going slowly because of some kind of issue going on with the cluster, either some background work blocking it or some other kind of resource bottleneck. I mean, we have the ability to dynamically shift both your recovery sleep max back goals and recovery max active, right? At a basic boring hard to use level. Yeah. I yeah, guess, but yeah. Uh, it has to be done manually, right? I mean, there's yeah. nothing automatic that does it for us now. 
And the idea with Adaptive was to do it automatically. So Josh, would it be fair to say that you're thinking that once we have the QoS machinery, this part will eff effectively take care of itself? Uh, yes. That's her. Yes. Yeah, so I, we do, I, I. We do have agree, a manual escape yeah. valve for, for now until then. So yes. And yeah. we even have that expose the dashboard actually already with uh, a low, medium, and high um, setting for recovery that changes the sleep and the max backfills and max active. Right, I think, yeah, sorry, go for it. I was gonna say, I wonder if that dashboard button should be also surface via the CLI, because right now I think it's only a dashboard thing. Yeah. Ultimately, but, in the long run, you don't want the user even thinking about it, right? Well, that's the there's always gonna be, I think right. there's always yeah. gonna be some knob that says, if clusters recovering, repairing, I wanted to aggressively do this at the expense of client workload, or I wanted to very slowly do this and never affect clients. Like there's there's some adjustment there that a human will have an opinion about. Sure, I suppose. Within that, I suppose you have maybe varying degrees of it shifting, right? Like it would once you are looking at QoS and looking at adaptive behavior, you'll yeah. you'll want to. Still within that, whatever the user says, kind of be like, okay, right now I really need to back yeah. off. Or, yeah. Yeah. In theory, we would follow that perfect. I guess my only my only concern here is that it, a lot of this depends on how the Q depth management QoS stuff goes, as if that isn't working out, <laughs> it's not. Like they were going to well, have it. Yeah. Work, then we do probably want to do the adaptive, adaptive. Well, work the thing right. is, it's addressing a different problem, right? And so it's it's a uh, adaptive recovery is mostly just about like what today we have the conservative defaults that basically let client I/O proceed unhindered by recovery, and it's covering and, and deleting other background operations. Um. Well, I mean, if well, the QoS the worked, especially. then that would happen automatically. I guess. Yes. Yes. For recovery, especially, it, it I'm guessing that it's actually quite quite slow, even in the low client IO case right now, which is bad. So even some yeah. kind of force level of yeah, there's really no IO going on. We can we can speed things up a bit. Would probably be a substantially sized win in the short term. I mean, even right. once we do have the QDAP stuff under control, it's unclear how long it would take to get the QoS stuff to reliably not speed up client IO. So we might still need these controls. These controls Sam, are if I... something we could backport. I don't think yeah. the QoS, the QoS stuff, I don't think we could backport the QoS stuff. Yeah. Not the QoS, no, but the control. Mm -hmm. Like if, I mean, I yes. think this is really yeah. about the sleep. Like right. the sleep mm -hmm. is the one thing that makes recovery go slow even when there's no client IO. So this is a back yeah. off of the sleep, basically what we're talking about. And specifically, we're, this is just the, the, the like, case where we detect there's no client IO, so we get rid of the sleep. Is that, yeah. I mean, is it really just boil down to that? Yeah. 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 That, that seems very reasonable. I kind of think we should just do it anyway. Because even if we end up being able to throw it away because the QoS stuff works great for Octopus, we can still backport it to another list. That's true. And if we can just do a like, like course heuristic, like locally at the OSD or something. Yeah. Then we should do something fantastic. like really simple, not, not yeah, that's, trip over ourselves. Yeah, trying to exactly. Oh, yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking as well, that we want it as a temporary measure. So I might not want to invest too much because we anyways investing more effort into the QoS stuff. Okay, so let that be there for Octopus and uh, see how that goes. Should we adjust the description here to just be basically skipping the sleep if there's no client IO? Sure, yeah. Yeah, at least we can. Yeah. Are you doing that, Sage, or should Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. How, how is the QoS? stuff going is it does it seem like it's gonna land an octopus and do well or it's in such oh. a larval stage that it's <laughs> larval i've gotten as far as being able to run benchmark 
okay. want to see what uh, uh, Shady Shingo and the folks from ZTE ha have as well. Yeah. It's a look on. They mentioned they have some patches that they want to submit a PR for. Yes. Uh, maybe. maybe... Might... Sorry. Go forward, Mark. I guess I was just going to say that given kind of historically how it's gone and, and kind of where we're at right now with it, these really targeted, simple um, solutions seem like they're going to be a lot more valuable to us in the short term. If, if it, we can identify, you know, very specific cases where we have a, a bad behavior like this, I, th I think doing more of these is kind of the way to go. To be clear, though, we do actually have to do QL as part. Um, yeah, but yeah, so to be back on Mark, well, there's another reason to do it also. Um, having a really stupid hammer is really useful in emergency situations. So even once we do have the smarter answer, we, we, we may leave the hammer disabled by default, but it would be nice to have it. Yep. And the other thing that was on my mind was that, uh, as Josh mentioned, that she and the group have already implemented uh, form of QoS and they're using it and stuff. So, uh, considering that the next CDM is an APAC friendly time, it might not be a bad idea for us to uh, please ask him to talk about it a little more. Have they submitted a PR for that? He was going to. He was going to. He's still, I think, structuring it in a way that makes sense. Uh, but we had some discussion with him, and uh, overall, the idea made sense. So maybe bringing it to a larger audience makes sense i can i can take that up on myself to at least reach out and see if make it to the next idiom yeah it'd be great if they could get the pr posted before that so we could take a look yeah 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 that's uh, i wanted to start early because we still have like almost four weeks to go so. okay i think that's all on that topic uh, so, you, Josh, you've already moved the collect ping reply times and the slow up details above. So, I think those are, anyways, things that we want to do in parallel. Mm -hmm. I think, again, those will probably be pretty small and backwardable too. Yeah. Just a really quick question on the ping reply times where are those going to go? That there's just like, there will be dumped as perf counters or something, or? So that's a good question. I guess it could be dumped as perf counters. Um, I think we're thinking maybe having a health warning potentially too, for like really long ping times. Um. Okay. Okay. Do you have something else in mind? No, I just, I just was me. I was just wondering. <laughs> I wasn't sure what. Because any, anything you'd want to do with them would would require like more than one primary talking about the same problem, right? So that you can compare right. ping times, get an idea of where the problem is. You really need a two dimensional map of ping times, basically, right? In order to notice problems. Yeah, I mean, or you can do something very clever with the OSDs, but it's even better to stupid with the furniture. You can have a course special, like say, if there is ping times over like five seconds, then that's, that's probably a problem. Yeah, you can, in the you can limit collection, although that won't give you negative information, right? Then you'll only get, oh, my ping to this OSD is bad. It won't. Yeah, yeah. I think the idea was to expose the, the details either through perf counters or through an ASOC command or something so that um, we could collect it and okay. take that layers. One, one useful test that we've done in the past has been um, kind of all-to-all -all communication tests across the entire, you know, fabric of the network that the OSCs are on. Um, this would be sort of a primitive upon which that could be built. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's shown some very, very bad behaviors in, in uh, uh, user labs that we've tested before. I mean, the, the process right now is just kind of ad hoc using, like, um, Iperf three in a script to you know do that essentially, but we could build it into the OSDs. There were a couple student projects that looked at this, basically adding a OSD tell command that would do an explicit ping between two other OSDs, and then the idea was to write a manager module that would systematically look at the 
look at the connectivity of OSTs relative to each other um, with respect to the crush map. So it could hopefully infer that like these two racks can't talk to each other, for example. It didn't really get that far, but there was an implementation of um, that low level command, at least. So we might think about building blocks that would eventually lead up to. Yeah. It's kind of interesting because it's not just even rack to rack. It's like inside the switch, right? You can end up with it could be, some yeah. switches that like do really stupid things that like have bad routes between ports and stuff. I mean, once the manager has, the, well, either all of the ping information coming in or just the outliers, then yeah. you can be arbitrarily clever, right? Yeah. The limits only our imagination. Yeah. Well, the yeah. I mean, the thing is, right now, the the peers are semi-random. Yeah. And so you might want to like, we might want to adjust our selection of peers so that it's more systematic. Well, notably okay. though. But, our selection yeah. appears to the exact peers we want to talk to to complete an IO, which happens to be yeah. true. Yeah. Anyway, okay. We should probably move on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the next one is refactor resolver. This was about refactoring the local and remote resolvers. This has been a pet peeve yeah. of mine. Um, and one I I might want to bite off since I finished the other stuff <laughs> working on right now. Um, both because right now the minimum you can set is effectively two because there's a local and a remote reservation, so you're always doing like two scrubs at once. Um, but also, if we do this, this would be the place where we could have more sophisticated reservations. Like, I only want this many scrubs to go on within mass scrubs recoveries within a rack. Or between racks or something like that, which would require manager coordination, but at least this would have the refactor that would at least centralize that scheduling decision on the OSD so that there'd be one point of coordination with the manager. Um, but I don't know exactly how to prioritize it. I think it could provide us with more visibility into how like recovery is being scheduled. What exactly mm -hmm. is going on there? That would be pretty useful. Yeah. Get the visibility otherwise. Um, I worry that this is less valuable than the other. For instance, doing two scrubs concurrently isn't really a big deal if they're going slowly. It's the act. It, it's it's the number of objects you're blocking I/O on at once that's really the killer. All right. I guess having two two backfills at once would be the same thing. Exactly. Well, um, yeah, two backfills at once is a little bit worse because you're keeping two PGs incomplete for longer. So that's a stronger argument than actually than the scrub one. Yeah, maybe never mind. And we want to get into all the deadlock problems. Well, if you centralize it in the manager, there aren't any. Manager will just do okay. it. And I think it's um, the, the expectation is. Though. Even centralizing the, the logic in the OSD, it would do some sort of back off, deadlock detection and back off. So, can embed a protocol to do that. Whereas right now, it's kind of a naive lock ordering thing. If we are putting stuff to the manager, though, what's the fallback if the manager's dead? That's the problem. We would have to work out what it means. That's well, a... it's, it's not so much the manager dies, it's the manager forgot what the reservations are. So we need to sort of think about what that means to any in progress reservations. That's Probably my some primary kind of retry, recomplete thing. You complete any that are, have already been granted, and you retry globally all of the other ones, or something. It would be funky. This is my main concern about doing the manager thing because I think we'd end up with two implementations because I, I think we recovery is important enough that I think it has to work even if the manager is down. And so I think we both have to have the fully distributed variation and then also have sort of a manager coordinated one, which means we need to test both and it'd be weird. But I assume that the first step is just to continue with the fully distributed mode 
um, since that's roughly what we're doing now, and then we can decide later if and how to add the manage or triple one. But this will get us, it'll make it easier because it'll be centralized in one, <laughs> there'll be one bit of code in the OST that's managing all of the resolutions for the whole OST. Yeah, it might make some of the QoS work a bit easier too in terms of uh, factoring in background work. Maybe. Although, I guess at some level, we might end up not even needing reservations any, at that once uh, if QoS works well enough. Well, you still want them because you, you don't want, it's not so important for scrub, but for backform recovery at least. You, the longer you spend recovering, the longer you keep things. Uh, yeah not recovered, right? That's so you want to get one PG done. You don't want to get 10 PGs attempts done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. By the way, that seems like it's going to be, well, let's just keep it that way. Um, okay, the next one is uh, Lepredos Deep Sleep or uh, deep delete or delete clone. Uh, this and... came up in the RBD thing. Uh, this is like the one piece that's preventing RBD from having to do a full resync is having a Rados operation that will delete either specific clones of an object or delete an object and all of its clones. Ow. Uh, deep delete, whatever. Yeah. So I think it's pretty straightforward to implement. We just need to actually implement it. I'm sorry, what does this help with on RBD? Um, when RBD is doing its mirroring to another cluster, it's mirroring all of the snapshots also. And so it's like recreating the full snap history of the different blocks of the image. Um, and if it detects, there's like a scrub process, and if it detects that there's some discontinuity or whatever, then it like, it can't fix it because <laughs> it can't go and delete for that object, delete the clones, and then recreate them with the correct content. So, so it's deleting like all clones for the object at once instead of having to do yeah. like 20 different operations. Or without deleting the, the snapshot and then having the whole pool. Right, right, right. <laughs> or image, whatever, <laughs> clean up and then redo the whole image. Okay. All right, so this, this only happens if there's a bug or? If there's a bug, yeah. Okay. Or maybe, or a corruption or something or whatever, yeah. I'm just trying to get the context to if there was a thing where the snapshot thing genuinely wasn't working, that would also be interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure if this ever actually happens or not. Um, but well, it's total. It's a totally fair ask for even yeah. stuff like that's right. Right. To be able to correct problems like this if you detect them during a disk. Right. Anyway, I think it's pretty simple. Yeah. <clears throat> So the next one is remove my snaps thing. So you just do open one. Yep. Yep. This is Sorry. So it's it's not going to be hard to implement the operation, but I am a little worried about the policy around it because snapshots go from being immutable except on delete to just like another funny object fork. What? Right. We could have a special cap. So that yeah. Normal yeah. Double, the W cap doesn't allow you to delete clones, but uh. Yeah. X that's that's what I was thinking. It seems yeah. a little bit like the stable of special scrub operations, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Might want to check with Jason. I'm not sure if the RBD mirror already has abilities on it right as pool, but good. So. I mean, uh, I don't actually know whether the scrub ones have special cap caps, but you would want those to be in the same category, I think. The scrub ones. There's there like scrub operations. operations. There aren't any. Nope. nope. But there were. And this isn't doing. Yeah, this isn't doing that kind of scrub. Were. It's comparing across clusters. No, I know. I just. Re yeah. I apparently incorrectly remembered there being. Um, anyway. We talked about it. We just never did it. Um, okay, anyway, yeah, the remove snaps is in progress. That'll be done. 
Sounds good. So I think those were the ones that were already marked for Octopus. Do we want to just go down the list and see if anything else makes sense? Yeah. Uh, this audit injectable config options, this keeps coming every time, but yeah, I think there's been I... some work happening parallelly, but not like focused. This one I added recently because it was specifically int ones that I was stumbling across where most most of the time int ones are injectable, but occasionally they aren't. So it was an easier ask to review just those ones, not every other option. Mark, you had like a spreadsheet of uh, all the options at some point you were looking through, right? Of like all of the Ceph options? Yeah. Yes, I do. Let me pull that up. Yeah, I remember kind of being able to use that as a baseline for at least marking things runtime or not. Yes, let me find it here. I, I got through and audited, I think, about 10% of them and then didn't oh, wow. make That's it a lot. through more. <laughs> it's like quite a thousand options. <laughs> There's like 1,500 or something, and I think I got through like 150. Um, Were you skipping the dev options? Uh, no, I was trying to go through everything, like just to figure out like how much dead stuff that we had. Um, XIO was definitely a big one. Um, where is this thing? Let me... Here, I mean, uh, focus on finding it. You guys keep talking. Yeah, because I was thinking about going through it, and I thought that I would skip the dev ones because we're dealing with like user documentation and yeah, and 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 the return from when you modify it, whether it tells you you needed to have restarted the OSD or not. Yeah. But but like here's an, like let me just say because I happen to be working on Scrub, the Scrub min interval. At, at, at just first glance, it looks like, oh, it's just an int and it's looked at and it, there's no need to do anything. Well, in reality, there was. If you lowered the min interval, you would still have to wait till the next, like if it was from one day to half a day, you'd still have to wait for a day before it would recompute and reschedule it for, for the 12 hours mm -hmm. instead of 24 hours. So. Some things might appear an int at first blush is not needing any special right. handling, and we were missing any handling of that. Yeah, I think that's what this one was intended to be about. Mark, maybe you can like link your spreadsheet to that uh, color card. Uh, so I, so I, I just found it, but apparently it's on my Red Hat account, so I can't share it publicly. But I'll copy it over to my other one, and then I can get public. Thanks. Sure, I, I linked the Trello to which you need to attach it to. Okay. Yeah, I wish I wish they let us uh, on our Red Hat like account make things public. Yeah. It's really irritating. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like overall, it feels to me that we can do some work in this direction, but I'm not like open to like get an end-to-end -end solution for it. So. I don't know whether to market for octopus or not, but keep that at the back of our minds that we want to do this. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is the LTTNG trace points instead of logging. And Josh, do you think it makes sense to now so, modify uh, this card? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we should modify the card at this point to, I'll, I'll add it to say something about, um, Changing the way we're doing the logging, make it more efficient instead of because um, Mohammed basically investigated this um, a fair bit, and I think Bratislav took a look at it at some point too. Found that um, the main bottleneck was really the all the mem copies and the string creations that we're doing um, to get get all the individual pieces of information into the log, regard not the actual logging mechanism itself. So LTTNG doesn't actually help with that part. Yeah, it's it's both that, and then also I, I took a look at this a couple of months ago, and um, the lock that we hold for for logging across all the different threads can become very contended as well, which maybe is because we've got all that other stuff happening. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, 
I think we should look at some kind of binary log format, maybe using some existing library. Wait, that would be worse. We'd have to generate the text and then put it in binary format. That would make it slower. I don't think that would necessarily be slower. Well, if the problem is lock contention, then that's, well, anyway. It, it, like the O the O string stream stuff is often really slow. Right, but that's because every bit of code in the code base generates strings using O string. Or yes, but if we did binary locking, we could stop doing string generation. Right, but we'd have to retrofit the entire existing code. Base. Yes. Yeah. Probably not possible. Well, it's, it's clearly an effort we have to do to make the logging efficient in any mechanism, anyway. Well, I'm saying if we're if our problem is contented logs, then the answer is per thread local circular buffers, right? That's totally doable. There, there's yeah. probably some reasonable division artifacts, but you get them anyway, so whatever. Sam, there's probably some reasonable division between logging that we intend for users to look at and logging that we just like create for ourselves, right? That's entirely true. It would be it it absolutely makes sense to add a separate log channel mechanism that's intended to be on in production. For that, yes, it would make sense to create some kind of a binary fast path. Yeah. But that's a larger task than changing the logging infrastructure to be less uh, heavy. I think the yeah, less heavy part is kind of separate from the binary part in my mind. It seems like the I could, the making it binary does kind of force us to do that, but it's it could be done and it's keep kept as text as an intermediate step too. Although conceivably, maybe we should avoid text logging entirely in terms of before it gets too bad. Might be something to think about. I have another card to float. Um, the testing for localized reads. Yeah. I think historically we've ignored this because for hard disks, reading from replicas is generally a bad idea. It would go faster if you had the objects cached in one place. I think a lot of those, I think the picture is a little bit different with SSDs, where the in-memory cache is less important. Um, or probably reading from a SSD on the local node is faster than going over the network and reading from an SSD on another node. I thought the RBD tests already included this because they're using the balance reads by default. I think they only do it on the snapshots. That's right. The yeah. Objects, and I can't remember if they. I can't remember if we turned it off or not. <laughs> it's possible we turned it off. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's off because there are problems. Like it's not just going to be testing. We have known issues. Yeah. Right. I found a branch I created uh, many years ago that began adding the machinery to replicas. I'm not sure why I didn't merge it. It's probably because I ran into something that was genuinely hard and didn't want to fix it and didn't seem important. But it's like actually a fair amount of stuff. The replicas need to gain most of the locking infrastructure the primary currently has for tracking in progress writes. Um, it's actually a fairly chunky bit of work. It might be somewhat simplified because um, some of that in progress right consistency stuff got pushed down into the object store layer. But we should, no, yeah. It, we should. It's boring, stupid stuff. Like you can't send reads to the object store on an object that has current, that has ongoing modifications. Or do you mean the object store won't send current reads and writes in the same object? I'm not the other store, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Basically, the, the, the on readable. Object store, not at the object or, Okay. Yeah. The, ob, yeah. the object store doesn't have an on readable anymore, basically. It's all. Got it. Um, oh, anyway. Easier. All right. I think the question is should we like add the test, see what's broken, fix this thing? Do you have any idea how much of a performance benefit it would be? Well, Kyle had a point that it would be super handy on split clusters. That too. So if we care about split clusters, the start 
because it's it's less of a does this help and more of a yeah it helps that's a good point yeah. for converged environments so it'll help sorry in what environment stage hyper converged uh really why why there more than elsewhere because the client might have an OST that's on the local node that it could opportunistically read from. That's only going to be a small portion of write reads, right? It depends on I mean, if it's a small hyperconverged cluster, then it will be. You know, I mean, if it's a three, yeah. If it well, if it's oh, a three node thing, it's really all of them. That oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there are markets where that's just true all the time, right? Like Tolco edge installations, is that still a thing? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm sure that in like split Kubernetes OpenShift clusters was what Kyle was thinking of. Yeah. Oh, that's the split cluster case. I meant the three node yeah. cluster case. Yeah. Yeah. No. So yeah. So both of those are actual things that are yeah. very still much still alive. Anyway, I, I, my sense is that it would be worthwhile to add just a testing half of this. Even even if we don't merge it or leave it disabled, just so we can see what the current state of things is. Um, maybe we can take this up maybe. in the, in the uh, like our radar suite call or whatever. We can discuss how we should go about this. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think the testing basically just means we turn on balance reads or localized reads with the Rados yep. API tester, right? So. I think all I yeah. needed to do was. Take the Rados model thing and just add like the line. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Exactly. Okay. There. I found that uh, that Google Doc and and made it public on my other account. It does not list um, the types in here. I didn't apparently didn't look at that, but I could we could add it easily. Um, there's a summary tab at the beginning that just kind of says what the different, kind of tries to classify what they are, um, what groups they're in, and then a more kind of complex list of stuff. Sounds good. Cool. Okay, so the next one I see is mute health warnings. I can't tell how complicated we want to make the health F. Like mute this warning for this many hours. Detail changes and unmute. I don't. I don't know. I. <laughs> I layer that kind in front of, of other tools. So. One I don't know. I, have, I have a feeling that I mean, like, in one at one hand, we are saying we want more visibility. We want to know exactly what's happening. Uh, so we don't really want to mute things. We might be able to like change the severity of like what uh, an error slash warning should look like. That might be a better thing to do than just like mute things. No, but we, we kind of need this. Between, there's a distinction between reporting and um, just the error state of the system, right? If it's actually in a state we deem to be worn, I think Seth should probably just continue saying that. But it should be the case that whatever it is that's doing pager duty or what have you should just have the option to not not bother people if they know it's going to be a problem. Yeah, well, as an example, if you set no scrub and no deep scrub, it could be that you're running a cron job to do your scrubbing. So you would set those flags and then you would mute it because that just doesn't apply to you. So just because we decide that it's a warning doesn't mean the user that thinks it's a warning. Like, that's more like I declare this not to be a warn state. Right, well that's muting the warning, isn't it? I think of muting as more of a temporary thing. Yeah. Well, it could be a permanent mind. mute. <laughs> this is more of a mass, really. Yeah. The the like, feedback I, I heard at a... go off for the weekend type of thing. Yep, <laughs> yep, that was exactly it. The feedback yeah, I mean, that day was that specifically, uh, an admin at a site said that their company policy was that 
if there was a health warning, they got paged and had to come in. So, like, that was, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, like, like that, people have the other one, too, where they want to turn stuff off permanently. And, like, basically, they want the ability to configure their warnings around their policy, which is perfectly plausible, but I'm not sure that, that should be our job. Well, I think most, not most, many of the health warnings have a set of config options that control the parameters that of what constitutes a warning and what the, sometimes what the severity is. So I think continuing to flush those out on a per warning basis so that you can sort of control when that warning triggers, I think makes sense. I put that in one category. I think the muting is a separate thing. Like whatever the warnings are, whatever they are that's generated, having some ability to mute them for. Yeah, I remember like, something that came up in the past was um, how, being able to control the warning threshold for like how many or what percentage of objects getting scrub errors resulted in a health error versus health warning, that right. kind of stuff. Right. Like it feels like if you really wanted to, you could go through every health warning and think of all the like things that you'd want to change about that one health warning. Which would probably be a, a useful exercise. I'm not sure that I would put at the top of our priority list. But this is... I think this is different. This is like, I know there's a host down. It's okay. Don't page me right now <laughs> for another hour or whatever it is. That's probably not a very good example. I know that there's an inconsistent PG. I'm going to fix it on Monday. And don't bother me over the weekend. Well, but I mean, so does mute just mean it doesn't output that? Does it mean that your health status goes from health? Error exactly. or health warned to health okay, like exactly. Well, it's weird because I'm not sure you want to enable your cluster to lie to you like that. That sounds really dangerous. Well, you know, yeah, and what if it could be it could be X warnings to muted, right? It, yeah. it doesn't have to actually exactly. lie, right? But I worry that the UI for that is not trivial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because yeah. do a genuinely good job of it. Exactly. Yeah, like right. if if we do this, then we are going to customer cases where someone's like, my cluster stopped working without telling me and the, what's going to end up being the thing was oh an admin muted the warning yeah. about a host being down twice and then another one died <laughs> and no one ever noticed yeah, my only problem is what if you forget about it right i mean there's always human error involved and uh, then we are going to be responsible for giving people the option to mute it i think that's why like sef s should say health okay and then parentheses three muted warnings and health detail will show the muted warnings but the top will still say health okay. That's the, the thing though, I don't. Yes. I think I mean, you need to be very careful with the UI, but the fact that somebody can misuse the UI isn't a reason not to give them a feature that they're asking for. So you do your best and then so you. Talking, yeah, but I mean, but talking, the UI extensions you're talking about here are all things that don't show up in programmatic stuff. People mute it and then it goes health okay, and so now their dashboard shows green that they actually look at. I mean, there would depends be on what the dashboard, dashboard is. Too. Yeah, we, we kind of overload be... warnings, right? Like we've we've got well, we've got classifications of well, we've got certain classes of things that are really important, like where you can lose data potentially when you mute this, yeah. but you've got other classes of things like you have one more PG on the OSD than you theoretically should based on some arbitrary right. metric. And you have too many we, PGs. Yeah, and you're <laughs> throwing a health warning, right? I mean, right. it's ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that one's an argument for an intermediate severity, right? Line horn is the intermediate severity. That's true. Okay. So, yeah, like a health info. I think we can make the UI reasonable so that we minimize the ability to misuse it. We could even make it so that you're, we force you to specify a, a timing period and set a maximum or something so you can't mute it for more longer than some period of time, whatever. But I think the bigger question is, do we want to do anything like this at all, or are we just going to make people suffer through the weekend or pipe this into some third-party package that does let them mute things? Well, let me ask one other thing. Is would the is the task to mute all warnings for one day, or to mute all current warnings for one day? Mute a specific warning. Okay. My assumption would be they would mute the specific health code, like too many PGs, um, for some period of time, and then if the detail changed, then it yeah. would unmute. 
So if it goes, goes from one OC down to two OC stand, it would unmute and complain again. So do we already have those things classified that way, or are they just sort of? The health health warnings have health ID. They have codes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they have specific codes. Yeah. So that doesn't sound too bad then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I think it falls cleanly into the usability uh, story of ours. And if we have a cap as to like, okay, we are going to only let you do it for like two days or or something like that, then it makes sense to me. It probably has to be at least three days. You should be able to cleanly yeah. cover five yeah, days. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like if we're going to make it that configurable, though, then we actually do need to do the whole thing where you can specify different thresholds, or at least, I mean, we don't need to do it now, but like that's a reasonable extension for people to expect. Well, if I we're not just going to make them do it in their monitoring software. Well, I think the reason to put it up that we were that part's a good idea anyway. Yeah. Either either way. Are there certain kinds of warnings you shouldn't be able to mute, or does that just no? If you're going to get should be an error to do it, let's just. Just yeah. What I, one more thing I would say though is that instead of going to health okay, we just go to health mute. No, because if they're if the monitoring system is looking for health okay, then we have. Like, yeah, but I mean they need to. We need to have some indicator that they that their monitoring system like explicitly accepts. It nah, can't just. I don't. I don't think so. I, th I, th I think we've done our due diligence by raising an error that they had to manually mute. I'm sure so putting it on some desk. Yes. Continue yes, discussing the details of this later. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. I think the question is do we want to market for Octopus? How would we? I'm I'm okay either way. <laughs> Yeah, let's just mark it and then point we feel it doesn't make sense we can remove it. Let's schedule it for the, the next CDM. We can mm -hmm. put it on the agenda there too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we should probably not wait for that. We should email. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Our, your whole discussion. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So just um, just a quick time check. We According to the time, we have three more minutes, but we have a few lot of items to go through. And I guess we also want to do the Mon and the other blue store and other stuff in this meeting, right? Right. Should we go yeah, down all the radar stuff, or should we just move to blue store and like try to get stuff already marked for Octopus validated at least? I think we should go to the other list. I didn't see anything that was jumped okay. out of me at least the radar list. Oh. I just wanted to suggest we just remove the next, the just before we move on, this next one that we would have gotten to, that we just remove it. Like, I don't think we should do this. The make recovery limits separate from the max backfills. Sure. Okay. I'll go ahead. Okay. So the, for Blue Store, we have Shard RocksDB. And I think that's going to make it to. Octopus, so we don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, then we have investigate T Rocks TV that's also being worked on, but I don't want to make any promises as such for Octopus, so I'm not going to label it uh, as of now. Um, then we have prefix OMAP keys by pool ID. I thought that we did this when we redid the by pool stuff for. Forget which release, but we didn't. Um, the idea being that you would have OMAP utilization broken down by pool. Yeah. But it didn't do it. I forgot. <laughs> so okay. it'd be another blue store format change. Okay. Should we mark it for Octopus, you think? Maybe. I have to think a little bit more about what the compatibility issues are to see if it is easy to do. Okay. Would the pool ID come after the OMAP prefix that already exists? It would be at the very beginning and it would go in a different column family? No, it would go at the beginning. It would be, be the front of the key so that you could look at the 
key range and estimate how much space is used by OMAP for that entire pool while PG's in the pool. I'm trying to think about how what that means for the PR I've got where I want OMAP into its own column family. I'm not sure that I want an explosion of column families across multiple different pools. It wouldn't be a column family per pool. <coughs> you can estimate, there's an API to estimate a prefix range or whatever, a key range. So, so would you could work with the, with the sharding across different column families then? Because you, you have to do it. You have to do it for every shard. Yeah, okay. I don't, yeah, I, I'm. Well, and I, I presume this is less urgent if we do the scrub based yeah, OMAP yeah. accounting yes. anyway. Yeah. yeah. And th yeah, that's already there, yes. so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So next on the list is improve KV performance. Meaningless. Just going to remove this card because, yes, we want to improve it. <laughs> <laughs> Then there is, sorry. I was going to say, we're doing lots of things to improve KVE performance. <laughs> yeah. yeah but... I was going to be more polite and say, let's add some description to this, but then I think just removing it makes sense. Okay. Uh, then we have Blue Store, make it easy to identify hardware versus software errors. I think we actually did this mostly now. <laughs> the, well, Maybe the crash reports now tell you if there's an EIO on the device. We're not actually really doing anything programmatic about that yet. But um, I, I, don't, I would ignore. Is it that up to like a health warning or health error at some point later? Eventually. Um, or at least like a cluster log message. Yeah. There's a crash report. Yeah, it only happens if it's metadata, right? That would crash. If it's data, then we can do it. I mean, repair it. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, what does Blue Store return if there's an internal structure corruption? It, it, it asserts. Okay. It'll crash. I mean, the OSD fails, so there's already a health warning. Anyway, I don't, okay. yeah. And SBDK at rest, I don't know if that's it. I don't, I'm not worried about yeah. that. Okay, so let's go to Mon then. Uh, Mon memory target is on track for Octopus. So then we have Mon SVC status commands. None of these really stand out as priorities to me, to be honest. Okay. But maybe this pool creation for RGW and expulsion enforces the class rule set. I'm not sure exactly how that would or should work. I mean, the idea here is to try to prevent people from putting their index pool on slow devices. <laughs> I think this came out from something downstream, probably. Yeah. But I don't know the right way to do that. Yeah, it might make more sense. Okay. We had like the pool sets, pool sets concept that John was thinking of. Create the pools all at once for a given application. Yeah. yeah. But, Yeah. So do any of the others in the mon column mix? Do, I know in the manager, there's a radar stop thing that we wanted to do, but I think that can use a little more discussion around exactly what we want to do there. Yeah. For the monitor memory target, is there anything else we want to add to that besides the OSD map cache? Are there other large uses of memory in the mon? It's just the rocks to be. Rocks to be in the OSD map. Those are the only two. Okay, so those are both already in there. Yeah. Well, they're the only two that I know about. One thing with um, the priority cache manager and both the MON and all the other things that are going to start using this, um, 
I've been thinking about maybe implementing it something to allow it to burst over kind of the the target if the amount of memory on the node is is underutilized. So you could specify both like a OSD or like a something memory target and then a something burst target. And the idea would be that like with a higher priority the mon could utilize more memory than like an OSD would potentially. So like if if the mon needed it, like for some reason there's like a bunch of OSD maps that need to be cached that wouldn't be able to be cached otherwise, then it'd be able to more aggressively burst into any available memory on the node up to that limit versus the OSDs or other things that may don't need it as much. I think we should worry about that when we figure out a scenario where the monitor knows it needs more memory. Well, that, I was thinking this. I was thinking specifically of that case in Madison where you had to up the the amount of cache for Rocks DB to get yeah, back into a, a stable human state. had to do that. So I don't think this could be connect. automatic. I don't know if it's possible to feasible to do that. You'd only need to look at the hit rate of the the Rocks DB cache because in your scenario right there, you were you're almost certainly having a bunch of cache misses, right? Yeah, but how do you know what the expected hit rate is? Well, you would be able to look at the hit rate and then look at the latency of the reads when you're doing the read of the OSD map, right? Like if that latency gets to be high, potentially then between that and the, the hit rate information, you can start getting an idea of like, do I want more memory for the cache, for the RxB block cache specifically? I think it's doable. It's not that it's not doable, it's just, it's a lot of introspection that we don't have and wouldn't use for any other purpose yet. Yeah. And our memory management is already a problem, so I, I don't think this is a useful area to add it, <laughs> to add the complexity. Yeah, I guess I would I would worry about bursting memory after we have that introspection, why isn't at the top of the list? So first things first. Meanwhile, we do need bomb memory target and MDS memory yeah. target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those should both be there pretty soon, I think. It's not, I mean, the, yeah, hope so. basically the codes, all you need to do is tie it in. Yeah. It should be pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, um, so I think that's all we have with this, this messenger thing where we have message using dual stack IPv4, IPv6. I can't tell how important that is. <laughs> but it's marked for Octopus, so. Yeah, I think I marked it that way just because it's it should be pretty easy. Like 95% of the infrastructure is there. It's a matter of making the config options and the parsing like behave. Basically, writing the test and like fixing the handful of annoying things that pop up. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. I think. And then the other one is inter security is the Kerberos suffix auth mode. Yeah. Um, and I think um, Daniel at SUSE is looking at that, and Marcus is running some input. So hopefully we'll be able to get that done for Octopus. Okay. I don't really know what this RJWSTS card means is flagged for Nautilus. The check with, talk about that in your HW call. Cool, uh, then we have this common config escape single code double quote small. I don't know. I don't know how much matters. Yeah. We're trying to get away from stuff.conf anyway. I think then I think we've covered most of the things. 
So this isn't a card, and I brought it up in the CLT this morning, but in a wider audience. I think we should start talking about deprecating cash tiers. And this seems like a place to discuss it. Yeah, I think we should I think we should discuss it on the list. And such users find out how many people are still using it. Okay. So I, I just I my assumption would be that if we decide to go for it, then we have to deprecate it in yeah, in yeah. this release and then actually rip it out after the branch for whatever's next. I forget. P. Yeah. Most of the people I knew that were using it were using it to do EC with RBD. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'd be interested in hearing an updated set of users <laughs> talking about how it works and what they're using it for. Because it used to be that Flash was super expensive, and so having tiering was like really important. Flash is still expensive, but it's not as expensive, so maybe it's less. Complex. And I mean, and if we're actually going to maintain it, I think we need to. If we don't de deprecate it, I think we need to like put more effort into it because we just Buggy. ignore it, and there are definitely bugs in the tracker around yeah. it. So okay. there are still no. I mean. Are there any large commercial users that we're aware of, or large white users, like just larger commercial users? Anyone using it seriously? There know. are. Red Hat doesn't. I don't know if SUSE supports it. I think SUSE does nominally, but I haven't heard that they have any real big people on it. I know there are some people with decent-sized community installs, but they are mostly the sort of who'd like worked out that they're hot set change very slowly, so even the old busted Firefly one worked for them and they didn't ever upgrade. It's like a uh, backup, backup use case is the one that it works okay. Anyway. It would be really nice not to have to think about it for Crimson. Um, well, I don't know. I feel like there are two layers of problem. One of them is that the existing way in which the IO path and classic OSD works didn't expand to accommodate it in a way that was comfortable for anyone. Um, if we're designing for it up front by paying close attention to just making it easy to find where things are blocking and why, then it may not be so bad in Crimson. Um, and I do think we broadly speaking, worked out the rate of level problems, so we won't have to worry about that part again. Yeah. Well, provided that we didn't find a problem with snapshots and removed snaps. Uh, they're still like ordering bugs with uh, limited numbers of um, web entries between t uh, going between tiers and yeah. that kind of thing. I mean, that's actually true with regular OSDs too. Is that a thing we've ever seen in real life, or is that more a short log? Only, in, only in testing when we have short PG logs. Yeah, well, that's kind of designed to do that, right? Yeah. Yep. I think my my only like longer term concern that um, I would like to maintain some tiering capability in Rados with the redirects because I think that mechanism is going to enable us to do the dedupe stuff, and I'm hoping that we can settle on something, even if we deprecate the cache tiering part. Um, those use cases can be captured by the more explicit tiering or whatever. Um, but that's not a thing we presently have. Is it, do we have redirects? We have parts of it. We have redirects, yes. But, but it was the actually the first case. part that got done. Yeah. It was also much simpler. And I guess we haven't used it much, so probably there are bugs in it. But it's conceptually a lot easier to work with. Yeah. It removes the ambiguity with cache tiering where you don't know whether the object exists or not at the cache tier level because that, that base tier always has the full metadata for everything, either a redirect or the actual object. So. <clears throat> but 
either way, I think I think the first step is to figure out who's using cache two and for what, and decide whether they're compelling use cases or not. As devices get faster and the network doesn't, I think it's going to be harder and harder to make it like useful because the just the eviction and and promotion rates. Like you know, in the future, if we're looking at like NVMe is the slow tier and like PMEM is the fast tier, the oh, I don't think it's is, ever going to be useful in that context. There's not enough. No. It's it, 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 this would probably never be useful for anything faster than spinning disk or slower and NVMe or faster or SSDs are faster. Yeah, but that's exactly my point is that you know as, but as that things may always changing. that may always be alive. Like that use case may never go away. Yeah, I mean hard disks do keep getting cheaper per terabyte. It's not like they stayed at the same price. Yeah, they're not going away for another decade, <laughs> half decade at least. Look at tape. And they may well be replaced by another really slow, really cheap storage thing. Like that concept right. may never entirely go, go away. Yeah. I mean, the gap between bad SSDs or between bulk SSDs and NVMe may wind up being really big. Right. Um, I guess the. The question I'd have in that case would be, is this kind of an automatic tiering process really the the right way to go about it? But oh, anyway, I we think can go on record as saying no. Yeah. It, that's, that's, that's yeah. a little different. Yeah. All right. Do we have anything else to discuss? We're all good. I think we're good. Cool. Like we have enough things to do for Octopus, and thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. See you. See you.